Hey guys, I am Pixel Dan, and today I've got a really fun interview. I had the opportunity, uh, thanks to the fine folks over at Entertainment Earth, to chat with Wyla Eason, the creator of Sunman. Now, Sunman has been getting a lot of attention as of late because of his inclusion in the Masters of the Universe line. It's really fun to see this happen because... As you're going to find out, Sun Man and the Rulers of the Sun started out as sort of an extra line to be played alongside with Masters of the Universe. And here we are 40 years later, and now they are officially part of the line. Now, a lot of collectors have been well aware of this toy line for many years now, but with this kind of going a little bit more mainstream as part of Origins, I've seen a lot of folks wondering who these characters are. So... We're going to start things off by asking Wyla, who is Sun Man? Your audience, I know they know He-Man. I know they know yes. Masters of the Universe. Uh, so they they probably do want to understand who uh, Sun Man is. And I think you probably know the basics where my son was three years old and he said he couldn't be a superhero because he was black. And my former husband and I went out and tried to find him one, couldn't find one. And that's what led to the creation of Sun Man and that he was named Sun Man because of if the typically people who live near the equator is skin that's darker to protect uh -huh. them from the sun because and the sun makes your skin browner as well. So that was why the sun and of course it didn't hurt that He-Man, I mean, naming, using the same nomenclature that Mattel had already set up, made him appear to be somebody who was already a part of that line, if you will. Sun Man, He-Man, they, they, of they, course. you know, they, they kind of match. No. And the whole intent was to have Sun Man fit into play with He-Man so that you of could just course. Talk with, with your other toys and he was a part of the whole team. So that, that was all very intentional. That's, that's really a wonderful story. And have you, did you have any, um, did you like have any involvement or any knowledge of the toy industry before that? I'm, I'm really curious about how, like you came up with this idea to do your own toy line. How did you get started actually doing it? Well, I, I got lucky or the universe blessed me with a lawyer who had a toy client. I don't know what he was into, some kind of plastic, but whatever he was into, he just openly told me, this is how you do it. And yes, I had zero knowledge prior to starting the toy company. My background was mostly in journalism. I had been a reporter for the Tulsa Tribune, which is where I'm from, Oklahoma, Dayton Daily News, Chicago Tribune, New York Times. And prior to launching this, I was a financial editor at Standard & Poor's. So I was as far away right. from <laughs> the toy industry as one could be, nor was I a collector, nor did I grow up playing with a lot of dolls. I was like an outdoor girl, you know, right. a little tomboyish growing up. So I wasn't even... I had a couple of dolls, but that was pretty much it. So it truly was as a mother, you know, that really was my intro into this whole arena was, and I think also, you know, the ignorance is bliss. If you don't, if you aren't afraid of something, then you believe you can do it. Sure. <laughs> if you don't, and, and think about it. I had no idea how complex the toy industry was. Toy, it sounds simple, it sounds easy, it sounds fun. It's nothing like that, as we all know, <laughs> from the manufacturing and business. It's right, exactly, right. Ruthless is like the fashion or the beauty industry. That's what it's really like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. But I did my ignorance, the ignorance is bliss. That part of me made me not be intimidated by it in the least bit. But I didn't know it was such a club I was walking into. I had no idea. That's really interesting. So did you run into any sort of complications or were there ever any issues with it being too similar to He-Man at the time that it caused some problems? 
Not at all. That was not the what I ran into. What I ran into was basically you don't belong in this business. I launched in June. I didn't know you are supposed to present oh. in February. So my lack of knowledge of Toy Fair. Toy Fair and how insular it was. What, as I said, when I talk about a club, I had no idea. Everybody knew everybody, basically. Mm -hmm. This is in 85. This was before the internet. This was before social media. So you had to have an in. You had to know people. It was not, this was not one of those um, industries you just walked into without any association. So what I got was very much, you're the outsider. And then what one oh, account, oh, yeah. you know, what one account told me was you can't have an idea because if you really had an idea, Mattel would have already done it. So I was, I was dismissed instantly. <laughs> and I think there was also a tremendous amount of resistance to it being a black toy. They told me maybe, maybe mothers want their girls to play with black do dolls, but they don't care what their boys play with. So it, it was, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. I, oh, I'm wow. The I'm the yeah. Mother. Started this, uh, <laughs> you would know firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little bit of knowledge of what I am talking about. I think what did help me in, in a sense was that because of my journalism background, because at this point I did have an MBA from Harvard, I went about it as a very analytical approach. And before I talked about the toys, I tried to address their consumers. And I mostly gave a demographic presentation before I brought out the toy. I, I would say, if we take America and we cut it at age three right now, that was in 87, you will see the country is browning up. There are they're Black, Hispanic, Asians that you need to be catering to. I had no idea that was a radical concept back then, 37 yeah. years ago. That multicultural marketing was radical. It was only being done in skincare, makeup, hair products, and pantyhose. That was the only way differences in culture and color was being addressed. So to come and address it from a toy perspective was a leap for the toy buyers. And I had no idea. As I said, being ignorant helped me because I had no idea what I was going to encounter when I came out. So the way I kind of overcame that, again, before the internet, you could take out an ad in Ebony Magazine, which we did, a full page ad, and at that point reach 80% of the black market. That Back then you had one vehicle that appealed to everybody. So that's what we did. And then we started grassroots, barbershops, beauty shops, um, street vendors, organizations, clubs, and built a market so we could then proof of concept go back in February and say, hey, we're selling this. We're selling it very well. You should take it in. So that that was the part. That's great. And how was the reception on that when you finally got it out there? Was it received well? Good Because I, I think I read like the sales numbers were really good on those, right? We were able to grow the company to more than 5 million in sales. So, I That's mean, that wonderful. was by that time we had everything. We had dolls, we had games, we had before the before I closed the company basically. But yeah, people were hungry for that. And I kind of liken it to the fact that, you know, when the Black Panther movie came out, everybody mm -hmm. was shocked at the reception and how popular it was because there really had never been a fantasy Black super movie presented but who doesn't want to fantasize about being super i mean i don't care what color you are who you are everybody exactly imagination wants to soar everybody is into that and i think that's what we presented and we did present as i said a rather studied kind of way into it i had the honor and privilege of talking to dr kenneth clark who with his wife mamie were the people who did the black doll study that led to the Brown versus Board of Education desegregation decision in 1954. Wow. And that was the most uh, relevant study that had ever been done about black children with toys. And what they showed was 
They showed the kids, they were all black, a white toy and a black doll and said, which one is pretty? Which one is smart? Which one is fun? Which one do you want to play with? And all the black kids picked the white toy. And then when they asked, well, which toy looks like you? They very sheepishly, almost embarrassing, shamely would point to the black toy. Oh, wow. And that was a part what they started developing the study that said maybe being segregated is help, helping these kids not think they are of value. And if they can't be of value in a toy, then maybe they can't see themselves as being um, accomplished people or realize their dreams. So that's when I began to understand, oh, wow, toys are very deep. I, I had no idea what toe I was putting my water, my what water I was putting my toe into early on. Trust me, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I was well, getting into. And it's it's really interesting to think about it from from that kind of point of view. But like, look how many of us have grown up now, and like, here I am still talking about all these toys I had as a kid. So clearly, they have an impact on us, right? They are very important characters. These heroes, like, they've really resonated with us. So they are important to us. So it makes perfect sense that they should represent everybody. I think that really, that's a really good point. Yes. Yeah. So that, that first line that are the Sunman line was a very diverse line of characters. Did you have any involvement or how involved were you with some of the designs of those characters? I was, I'm only a stick figure person. I can draw a <laughs> <Sure>. stick <figure. laughs> But I can Same. communicate well. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can communicate well. And I could say, he should look like this or it should look like that. And I think what we, what I, how involved was I basically did everything. I mean, I led all the design. I didn't even, and now I understand. And I, again, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't realize I was becoming a design person. You know, uh -huh. I was stepping out of, my world of writing and analysis and business. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, talking to analysts about profit and loss statements and percentage growth. That was my perspective, basically. So then I didn't realize that I was now becoming a designer. It was just fun, you know, yeah. to look at, okay, what are they going to wear? Okay, what are they going to... How, what characteristics are they going to have? But I consciously knew, and it was because of the demographic research that we wanted Black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, and we did a white superhero toy as well as a part of our, of our entire line. We had full representation in terms of what, and I there think it as Look I at that. said, you know, they said, oh, you were ahead of your time, but when you're in the time, you're not thinking you're ahead. You're just dealing with, what's in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's what I was looking at was this He-Man line is great and it's got everybody's attention, but it's somewhat exclusionary. It's left out a whole bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, that was 85. They weren't thinking that way back. Well, they started in 84. I think He-Man first came out in 83. 80, yeah, 82, 83. 83 is where it really kind of boomed. Yeah. Right. So they're 40 years. So 40 years ago <laughs> if you were, <laughs> was almost a different concept of where we are today. Right. Which is why when Ed Duncan, head of Boys Toys, reached out to me, which he did through LinkedIn, and our, our relationship was very organic, if you will. He sent me a note on LinkedIn and said, hi. He either said, I've been reading about you, or I've heard about you, and I think it's wonderful what you're doing. I head up the boys' toys at Mattel, and by the way, I'm African-American. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> He's heading up boys' toys at Mattel, and I'm thinking, this is certainly a new age we're into. So we just started chatting. That's they didn't reach out to me and say, hey, we want Sunman to be a part of the He-Man's 40th anniversary. It, it did not happen that way. It oh. was just organically discussions. We started talking. Wouldn't it be interesting if Sunman was a part of it? He-Man. And then it was, he was like, you know what? Let me run that up the flagpole. And then when he started chatting about it at Mattel, 
they were like, that sounds like a good idea. And then he talked to his designers and as you know, toy collectors, they were like, oh, we know Sun Man, that would be really great, blah, blah, blah. That's how it developed. It, that it, is awesome. It was really that organic. It is just, that, and that's the, did you ever think that you would have this chance to reintroduce Sun Man to a new generation? Not at all, because think about it. Mattel, in effect, put me in business. Had mm -hmm. Mattel had a black superhero toy, when we came back from our vacation, we would have gone to the shelf, bought one, given it to my son. Here you are, son, have fun. <laughs> and that would have been, I'd gone back to my analyzing spreadsheets life. <laughs> right. That's amazing. That is so amazing. Oh. So, oh. so, and, and that, yeah, like you said, it's the 40th anniversary of He-Man, which is amazing. And one of the ways they're celebrating that is by bringing in not just Sun Man, but several of his friends huh. as well and Pighead. I mean, they are all coming into the oh, line. Uh, yeah. It's crazy to me. It, this, is, this is the most delicious irony you can think of. I mean, <laughs> if, if you are me, it's like, how, how did, you know, I, I just kind of, I was like, how did my life get so good like this? I, I'm not knocking it. I'm just so grateful and happy because you wouldn't expect this. I mean, come on. And you know, kudos to Mattel for being that progressive to say, hey, we're going to do something like this because, you know, they're a five billion dollar company. Come on. They don't they can create their own everything, period. Right. But to reach back and get something authentic from, you know, the past to to bring in that nostalgia for those who knew and for those who don't know to say, hey, we think this is important enough for all of our audience to be exposed to. I I, I really appreciate where we are today that yeah kind of absolutely absolutely so as somebody who's been you know a fan and and collecting masters of the universe for <laughs> such a long time now i will say like the collector community has like the sun man figures have been one of those like very popular side collections for years i remember the first time i was online and saw pictures of sun man and big head I was like, those are awesome. And I want to track those down and add them to my collection. Because I think a lot of us who grew up as fans of He-Man just love all of the figures that are in that style. And we're always looking for something new to add to that display. And Sunman and Pighead have always, those two specifically for me, there's a lot of us in the collector community where as soon as Mattel made that announcement, we were like, that is perfect. That is so neat. But there's a lot of people out there who are getting introduced to Sun Man for the first time. And I, I think that is wonderful too. And that's that's part of the reason I wanted to have this chat with you today so we can really tell the story and introduce who Sun Man is. That's wonderful. As I said, I owe the collective community for keeping, I mean, imagine keeping it alive all these years. Mm -hmm. You have to to the point where when Ed mentions it inside Mattel, they go, oh, yeah, we love Sun Man. I mean, so that that helped propel it inside the organization, that the people who are their designers were aware of the toy and knew all about it. I'm always amazed when I run into people who, you know, they're 35, 33 up who know about it and are new of it or had it as a part of their life and now they've got their own kids and they're like they like the fact that they can now bring this out to them too yeah so i think i read somewhere sun man's likeness is he actually based on your son people have said that and maybe, <laughs> maybe you know somewhere subconsciously <laughs> that that was the image but remember he was only three he was three and four years right. old at that point so he was a little boy <laughs> and he doesn't look like my former husband he doesn't look like my dad I mean, he doesn't look like my dad either i think he became a composite mm -hmm. in, in, in some kind of ways sure you know, in terms of the the artist i worked with back then was actually my cousin's boyfriend <laughs> who then went on to have a really good career, got rest his soul. He recently died. He had a real good career as a children's book editor, a book illustrator, Boyd Cooper. And back then, this was before CAD printing. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you knew back then, you had to draw everything on a grid at the front. 
the back, <laughs> the bottom, the top, the left, the right. All of those renderings had to be done by hand. Wow. You know, back then. I wish I had a copy of all those original <laughs> something and you're in the middle of it, you're not thinking it's a legacy. You're not thinking that. <laughs> of know, course, you, of course. You don't, I wish I'd had that foresight, <laughs> but I was in the middle, in the trenches, you know, trying to make this happen back then. Right, right. And, and you know, that's not uncommon either. It's a lot of the, a lot of the toy designs from the seventies and eighties weren't kept. A lot of that stuff was just part of the job, you know, people weren't thinking ahead <laughs> that they might want to ha- hold on to that stuff someday. But right. like you said, you, you were at the time you were just, you were, it was all about getting it done and getting it made. Right. And, yep. and you guys did just that. And, you know, I got to say like, uh, as a mom who made a superhero toy line for her kid, I mean, that is pretty superhero in itself right i think what you did is really really amazing well thank you as i said at the time i'm hearing that now but at the time (laughs) you know um you're not thinking that (laughs) thank you guys so much for joining me for this interview and again thank you to entertainment earth for setting up this interview and to the lovely Wyla Eason for chatting with me and telling us her story. Uh, I thought this was such a wonderful conversation, and I hope that this was something that was exciting and entertaining for you guys. Maybe you learned about Sun Man and the Rulers of the Sun for the first time, uh, or maybe you were just curious and wanted to know more about this particular story. So I hope this interview was something that you all enjoyed. I want to remind everybody that the uh, pre-orders are available right now. I will put links in the video description so you can follow those over to Entertainment Earth if you want to add the Masters of the Universe Origins Sun Man to your collection. Thank you guys so very much for watching today's interview, and until next time.